All right, can everybody please come in? Can everybody please come in and settle down a little bit so we can start it? All right, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank, um, thank you all for coming, and I want to thank the many public officials that have joined us here today. Wednesday was a heart-wrenching day for the city of Philadelphia. As you know, six police officers were struck by gunfire, and others were injured while responding to the scene of an extremely dangerous accident. I am very grateful that their injuries were not life-threatening. And I commend Police Commissioner Richard Ross and the brave officers of the Philadelphia Police Department. Their careful and professional response, which spanned seven hours, ensured the safety of their fellow officers and the residents of North Philadelphia. In the face of what could have been a horrific tragedy, the peaceful resolution of the incident marks one of the finest moments in the history of the Philadelphia Police Department. And I, again, I'm again, very proud of each and every officer involved and proud of all of our officers and our force. The fact that our officers found themselves under such an attack while trying to carry out a basic function of their job is reprehensible. Seeing an entire neighborhood put in harm's way was nothing short of devastating. We can and must do more to protect our officers and all of our citizens. Of course, this incident is a reminder, a harsh reminder, of the devastating reality Americans face every day. Whether it's the mass shootings like we saw last week at El Paso and Dayton, guns have flooded American cities, leading to senseless and preventable violence. In fact, as dozens of officers were responding to the North Philadelphia incident last night, others in South Philadelphia were responding to another shooting, a young man shot in the head and later pronounced dead. That incident didn't draw national attention. It happens daily in this city and many others across the nation. But a life was lost last night to gun violence here in Philadelphia. And like so many other shootings, it goes unnoticed. It becomes every day. As I said last night, our officers need help. They need help keeping these weapons out of the hands of the bad guys. No one should have access to the kind of weaponry, weaponry and firepower that we saw in North Philadelphia last, yesterday. Several weeks ago, I attended a meeting of faith-based leaders in Philadelphia who are concerned about gun violence. Like the police, they are also on the front lines of this crisis. They are working every day to bring hope and faith to their communities. And they look to us here in government for answers. I sat during that meeting and heard their pleas for help and saw the despair in their eyes. Ministers, pastors, rabbi, imams, they came looking to us for help. I t told them simply, we are trying. In January, we launched a series of anti-violence initiatives that we believe can make a difference and is making a difference. But I also told these men and women of faith the simple truth. We here in city government can only do so much. 
Getting relief in the form of meaningful gun control legislation will save lives, the lives of residents and the lives of men and women who have sworn to protect us. Incidents like this should not keep happening, not in our city and not in our country. If we don't see, ch see change, gun violence will continue to ravage our communities and tear families apart. So I say to our state and federal lawmakers, step up or step aside. Help our police officers, help our clergy, and help our kids. And if you choose not to help us, then get out of the way and allow cities like Philadelphia that struggle with gun violence to enact their own solutions. Before I introduce Police Commissioner Ross, I just want to, yesterday when the incident started, we had the opportunity to sit in the police detail room and listen to the transmissions of the police back and forth to each other. First of all, bravery is the number one emotion that I felt for them, that they were brave. They were running towards heavy gunfire. Training and, and ability was unmatched. We, they were coordinated. They were talking to each other. They were directing each other. They were keeping each other safe while being barraged with, with, with ammunition and shots from a high-powered uh, uh, rifle. Uh, they stood out there, and they were patient and were there for seven hours under gunfire. And one of the things, one of the vignettes that I, that I saw on television last night while after it was all, almost all over, were, were the officers removing or helping remove the children from the daycare. To see our officers carrying little babies, holding kids' hands, and walking them to safety showed me what those men and women are really about. They're about protecting us. Now, I know we don't always do things perfectly, and there, there's trouble, and we stumble sometimes, but watching those officers carry those children and walk those children to safety gave me faith in this department and in this city and who we are as a city and the people who live here and what we are really all about. We have our violence problems. We have our crime problems. We have our poverty problems. But when it comes to reaching out and helping each other, we're there, and that's what we need to do now. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, uh, to introduce the best police commissioner in, in America. Thank you, Mayor, um, and I appreciate uh, all those accolades, but they are accolades that should go to the men and women of this police department who uh, did an absolutely stellar job last evening in protecting uh, that neighborhood. Uh, I can't say enough about uh, how they conducted themselves. Uh, it truly made me proud uh, to be on the ground with them to see how they represent this city each and every day. And as the mayor said, we don't always get it right. Nobody does. But when he described the scene like he did about the help that they gave in not only moving those young kids to safety, but assuaging the concerns of parents who were arriving at the scene, who were telling them, calm down, your child is okay. Words that a parent needs to hear more than anything else during a crisis like that. And so there are many heroes from last night, uh, probably too many to mention by name. Certainly you know of the six officers who were struck by gunfire, um, many more who did things that transcended just about anything I could ever imagine from SWAT and how meticulous they were and just the entire operation as well as how they ex extracted uh, those people from that scene. And I got to tell you, it was a, a truly harrowing experience for all those hours to know that you have not only two of your officers trapped upstairs from a gunman who has fired multiple rounds uh, from a, an assault rifle, but you also had citizens that were up there too. And not knowing uh, whether or not this gunman was going to decide to go out in what some may call as a blaze of his own glory and, and decide to basically charge those steps and try to take those people out upstairs. And so for a long time last night, I know our collective hearts were in our throats, not just at that scene, but probably for many people, not knowing how that was going to, to end. And I have to be honest with you, in the beginning of that scene being there, I did not think it would end nearly the way it did. I mean, there was dialogue that was being presented to us at the scene that suggested this, this man was not going to go back to prison. And he had made that clear, 
and we knew he had the weaponry. He was firing while I was at the scene, and certainly long before I got there, he continued to do so. And so the SWAT operation to Detective Timmy Brooks, who fed me every line he wanted me to, to give in negotiations, to many officers who arrived on the scene, and as my officers have told me, two of the heroes that most have not thought about, believe it or not, were the two officers upstairs. There were officers who knew they were trapped, who naturally wanted to go in immediately and get them. This is before SWAT got in. And as I understand it, these officers were astute enough and wise enough and brave enough to say, do not come in here. Do not come in here. If you come in here, you will be met with severe gunfire. Now think about what it takes to do that, to know that you're trapped in the building yourself. Your natural inclination is to say, help, come get me. But they did the opposite. And that speaks volumes of what we see each and every day. So we, we were dealt um, a hand that nobody should be dealt, thankful that no one died from it. All our officers were discharged from the hospital, but dealing with a violent felon who told me himself during negotiations that he had an extensive arrest record and that he did not want to deal with prison again and he wanted to do and get some deals, which you know obviously didn't happen. But I just want to thank you know, all those officers and tell them that if you feel like you don't and you are not appreciated, trust me, you are. And I know I speak for everyone up here and probably most in the room. You, know, you may not always feel like you get the respect and the due that you deserve, but you, there are many people who respect what you do, appreciate what you do, because most people couldn't do what you do. And so I thank them for all that they've done. I know you'll have questions later, but there's others that have to speak. I, you have a general idea of the, the circumstances. Uh, we can update you in questions a little later. But right now, I just want to introduce the governor uh, for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I just a few things. First of all, uh, Senator Casey and I, Senator Casey will speak next, uh, uh, visited District 39, the police officers, this morning uh, and told them uh, what the mayor and the commissioner have already said, that uh, they deserve our greatest respect uh, and thanks for, for what they did. They walked toward the line of fire, not away from it, and they did a phenomenal job in protecting the folks in Philadelphia. And it was miraculous that in the end only six people were injured and all of them are out of the hospital from gunfire. So it was an amazing thing and, and I think we all owe a lot to, to the police force. I also wanted to make sure that the state did everything it needed to do to help the city of Philadelphia in facing this crisis. Uh, and I asked both the mayor yesterday and, and I asked the, the uh, uh, officers at District 39 today if they thought there was anything that the state could have done more and they both said very nicely that we did everything we, we should have done and could have done. So uh, we stand ready to, to, to help with, with in any way we can. But one of the ways that we have to work, uh, as both the mayor and the commissioner have already said and others will talk about, is to end gun violence, is to start working and stop talking about this. Uh, there are a lot of things that we need to do to address all of the issues uh, that face uh, people in places like Philadelphia. But we've got to start with figuring out ways of getting guns out of the hands of people like the jerk who shot six officers yesterday and last night here in Philadelphia. I was going to have a press conference today uh, to announce executive actions that I'm going to take uh, to start that process and actually continue the process in Harrisburg. Uh, and part of that uh, I'll have that press conference instead tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, but part of that is to, to get the, and I will do everything I can as governor, but to get the General Assembly to step up and pass legislation that will start getting guns out of the hands of criminals like this. Uh, we need to do that. We have needed to do this for a long time. I think now is actually the time when we can actually make start, uh, start doing this. So I uh, commit to you that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will do everything we can to make sure this kind of thing stops happening here, in our shopping centers, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, at workplaces, everywhere. This has to stop. Now I'm pr proud to introduce our United States Senator, Bob Casey. Bob. Thanks, 
I'm going to start by thanking the governor and the mayor for their leadership as uh, leading elected officials who are here today from every level of government. Today, it's hard to comprehend and hard to put into words the valor, uh, the professionalism, and the skill that police officers in Philadelphia and their leadership exercised in the last 24 hours. Uh, can't begin to imagine how difficult a job they had. So we're grateful that all of our prayers, whatever faith we are, were answered yesterday, that police officers were shot at but not killed, and that children and neighbors in, in that community were not uh, killed in, in North Philadelphia. So we're happy about that. And I want to commend and salute again the officers uh, and the commissioner. But now comes the question of what is next by way of policy. In Washington, D.C., we have had, just by way of one example, a background check bill, a universal background check bill that came from the House of Representatives more than 160 days ago. Three United States representatives here, Representative Evans, Representative Dean, and Representative Scanlon. They did their job. It's time for the United States Senate to vote on a background check bill, but also not to forget about and not to push off for another day, finally, at long last, a ban on military-style assault weapons, which are weapons of war that should not be on our streets. Now, one of the problems is, in Washington, the NRA and far-right groups have a grip on the Republican caucus in the Senate. That's a big problem that we have to fight through. But basically, when you break down their argument, when they say we're not going to even going to debate these issues and we're not going to vote on them, basically what they're saying is that the American people who represent the most powerful nation in the world should surrender, surrender to this uniquely American problem of gun violence. That is not the American way. We don't do that in America. We don't surrender to any problem. So it's about time that we had a debate on the floor of the United States Senate, not simply on a background check bill, but also on a bill that deals with the weapon itself. So we have a lot of work to do. But as we're doing that, so many have re reminded us today about the community, and especially the children. I am not a medical professional, but you don't have to be to know that when a child experiences that kind of horror, that kind of trauma, those, the impact of that can be with them for a very long time. So whatever resources can be deployed to make sure that those children and the community can heal, we must come together on that as well. But I'm grateful that this broad coalition of people that are in this room today and well beyond this room representing a national consensus that we're Americans, we don't surrender, we're going to come together and fight back against this scourge. And with that, I want to introduce United States Representative Dwight Evans. I'd like to thank our senator uh, for laying that message out. Because the message he has laid out is not a new message to this crowd. If you live in this city and you're in this state, you face these challenges. Two of my colleagues, both who are on the Judiciary Committee, Mary Gay Scanlon, who's the vice chair of the committee, and Madeline Dean, have been part of the leadership in order to make this come. This is not new to us. We take the mayor up on his challenge. The police have done their part. The hospitals did their part. The community did their part. We now need to do our part. It's unfortunate that we come together under these circumstances, but we need to send a message that this is enough is enough. We have passed the bills, as the senator has just laid out, but we need to do more than that. We need to call on all of the public to understand that collectively we are in this together. It is not just the city and the police department that can solve this problem. This problem is far greater than what the mayor and the police department and anybody else can do. It is us collectively. So I thank for the leadership to have all of us. I've never seen this in my entire career. This may be this kind of a moment that we really need. The next person who is no stranger, who's been leading a great deal, is the president of city council, Councilman Darrell Clark.
Thank you, Congressman, and thank everybody. Uh, first of all, um, we're just so happy that our prayers were heard uh, last night as we stood outside the hospital. Um, folks were very concerned, the mayor and all of us, everybody. Um, so we're, 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 we're very, very happy that uh, all officers, our heroes, uh, were able to walk away from this um, without some very serious injuries. Um, and we continue to thank all of the support systems that were in place, uh, the executive team. Uh, we want to thank all those individuals at the two medical institutions that did a great job in terms of making sure that uh, they got the first-rate care. A um, couple of things. Um, so first things first. Um, we're going to be asking everybody engaged, people that are obviously not in this room, to put and check your partisan politics at the door, all right? And you check your personal perspective at the door because it's not about you and your personal perspective. It's about the citizens of the city of Philadelphia, the citizens of the state of Pennsylvania, and the citizens of this country, all right? This, this nonsense that we can't come up with a solution to solve it. We all know what. There, there are mental health issues. There are all other types of issues, social issues, but there's one underlying fact the too many weapons on the streets of this country. Bottom line. Bottom line. Bottom line. And, and this, this, this madness about, oh, well, I have to check. I have to go home and find out what my constituents say. How many polls do you need to have? Poll after poll says everybody wants us to do something. So do something, right? Members of the General Assembly, and obviously not the people in this room, because they are clearly pushing the envelope. But those other individuals, both in the state and the federal government, need to step to the plate and hear the hue and cry of the citizens of this country and move some good sense, reasonable legislation to get these assault-style weapons off the street. This is not Afghanistan. This is not Iraq, right? This is the United States of America. So this has no place in our country. Um, we are prepared. Um, my colleagues in council are prepared and continuous to be compared to do whatever we need to do, be it lobbying, being able to pass legislation once we are enabled by the state to do what we need to do to make sure that our streets continue to stay safe. So to all of us and to those family members, uh, we thank you. Um, I know that we have some work to do in the neighborhood. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Councilwoman Cindy Bass briefly and then Senator Street. Councilwoman Bass and I stood out there along with the, the rest of us and it was a clearly a challenging time. Councilwoman Bass. Thank you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to, number one, thank everyone for being here today, all of our colleagues standing together uh, in unison and all of the legislators who are here. But I also want to recognize the folks who are on the ground in the nice town Tioga area doing the work when all the cameras are gone, when the police are gone, when so many folks have gone on to the next issue, the next story. Majida Rashid and Zachariah Abdul Rahman, if you could stand, stand up so everybody knows who you are, because these are the community folks. When we talk about having the boots on the ground, these are the folks who are out on the ground every day making the difference. And now is the time for action. Now is the time for healing our city and healing this neighborhood. The amount of trauma that was inflicted on this community last night is absolutely unacceptable. And so we've been working with the council president's office and we're going to be working with all of our colleagues and folks who are interested to bring supportive services to the neighbors to make sure that they can deal with the trauma that they have uh, been exposed to just on yesterday. We're out canvassing today and tomorrow, providing information. There will be a community meeting this coming Saturday that our office is hosting with the Philadelphia Police Department to make sure folks have information. Information is power, and we want to keep them in the loop. And, and those are some of the things that we are going to be doing to make sure that there is an action behind this that is substantive and that is going to make a difference long term for the residents of this community. So thank you for having me. Thank you. You know, this is uh, always a difficult time. We had gunshots flying all around the neighborhood. And we will, when I return to Harrisburg, and I'm sure I'll have text messages and emails from colleagues from across the state leaving their thoughts and prayers. 
thoughts and prayers. Um, it reminds me of a story in the Bible, in the book of James in the second chapter. There was a story about a group of people that were on their way to church. They were religious people. Perhaps they called themselves part of the moral majority. And on their way to church, they passed some people in the streets that were in conditions that were a problem. They needed help. And they told them, we're going to pray for you except God. And the people didn't pay them much attention. They didn't have faith in them. They didn't believe in them. And they went and they asked their, their faith leader. They said, why is it that these folks who are in this condition have no faith with them? They said, well, what was their condition? They, they described the condition. And the faith leader began to ask them, well, what did you do to change their condition? And they said, well, we offered them pray, our thoughts and prayers. And he said, your faith without works is dead. And that's from the Bible. And I appreciate everything the governor is trying to do by executive order. And I think he is doing everything he can do. But that is not all that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania can do. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has within its power the ability to get some of these guns off of our streets. But it takes an action by the General Assembly. Senate Bill 483. <coughs> Senator Tartaglione introduced and has introduced in the past the reporting of lost and stolen handguns. To say that if a gun is lost or stolen, you don't even have to report it. The purpose of this legislation is to make sure that straw purchasers can, uh, can't just go buy a bunch of guns and take them back into the city here, in Pittsburgh, or any place else and sell them illegally. Senator Hughes's bill requiring firearm safety training course as a condition of uh, obtaining a concealed carry permit. We give people guns that don't even require that they understand how to, how to shoot them. And, 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 but yet still we can't get a vote on that bill either. Senator Sarah Nasario says you should at least, wants a bill that says you have to be required the safe storage of firearms. And yet and still we cannot get a vote on that bill either. Senator Haywood has a bill requiring a license for carrying a firearm so that the person carrying the firearm, we know is the person that is supposed to have the firearm, but we cannot get a vote on that bill. Senator Hughes and Senator Sarah DeSario have a bill about universal background checks for firearms. The U.S. Congress passed it, but neither the Pennsylvania House nor Senate will pass that legislation. And finally, Senator Fontana from Allegheny County representing the city of Pittsburgh which was the last mass shooting in Pennsylvania where people were shot and killed in a synagogue, introduced legislation requiring an assault weapons ban in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and we can't get a vote on that one either. So the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has not done everything it's supposed to do. We haven't even come close. I have, I'm a father of five children. My oldest daughter had a boyfriend that was murdered within the last three years. My son Sharif Jr. was a student at Imhotep, and all of us saw the career of his former teammate was, was gunned down. He had a full scholarship to Penn State. He was murdered last year. My son Lavian had his, his stepfather, his best friend's stepfather, was murdered within the last two years. And my daughter, went, Shayla, goes to Central, and, she, and a student was shot out, outside of Central, and that's supposed to be the best high school in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And, she, and even she wasn't safe. From, the, from, from her teammates getting, and her classmates being the victims of gun violence. So no, we in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania have not done everything we're supposed to do. We are derelict in our duties, and it is because the majority caucus is afraid of the NRA. They refuse to call a vote on this legislation. They are derelict in their duties. They've turned their backs on the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. they turn turned their backs on the people that were murdered in Square Hill. they turn turned their backs on the people that are shot in our communities every day. they turn turned their backs on people that are killed in Allentown and Reading and York and Erie, and yes, they turn turned their backs on the people of North Philadelphia, including its police department, who should not have to go up against people who have firearms that can shoot at a distance, fire weapons, and fire weapons in rapid fire. So we haven't come close, and we have work to do. And we have called, members of this, members standing up here have called for a special session. But we don't have time for a special session. We can debate and argue every kind of thing. There is legislation that has been offered. We have not held public hearings on that legislation. We have not held votes on that legislation. We have not even come close to doing what we're supposed to do. So the next time one of my colleagues offers their thoughts and prayers and pretends somehow that they are people of faith, I say until they show me some works, their faith is dead.
Thank you. So I, th I think the senator definitely expressed the uh, anger and frustration that we all have. If I could have the members from the House of Representatives to come a little closer, because there's a lot of members, a lot of diversity, and I want to make sure this is, this is uh, clear. This issue of gun violence does not just impact one area of this city. It impacts us all. Every time we turn on the television, go on social media, and we see some senseless killing, it sends chills through our body. We want to first start by commending the police and saying thank you, something that may not be said enough. And given all the things that's happened in the news in the last couple of weeks, a lot of folks have a hard time of saying that. But we're saying it today because we believe that we as politicians, we as fathers and mothers and aunts and uncles, we would not be running towards the bullets. We would be trying to find shelter. And for all those brave women and men who were running towards those bullets, we say thank you. But we also want to make it very clear that we all have a responsibility, not just those who are elected. Those children that we've seen on the television last night being escorted out of those daycares, those businesses that were on lockdown, the Temple University was on lockdown, they have families. They have feelings and emotions. They experience a level of trauma that some have never experienced before. But there are so many children in this city who experience on a daily basis. They didn't even blink yesterday. They didn't have any emotion yesterday because they see it every single day. That is a problem. That is a problem that has been around for way too long, and it's time that we address it head on and stop putting the blame in places it doesn't belong. It is us who need to step up as a community, as a city, as a state to ensure whatever is the grassroots of why folks feel the need to pick up an illegal firearm, we have to address that. As a youth growing up in an urban setting, I can tell you from my own experience, I felt that way when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, that I needed a firearm to protect me from my community. We need to check that. We need to go into these schools and ask the real questions of is children feeling safe in their communities and they're not, what can we do? And I can assure you, we can make the steps to ban assault weapons and all those other things, but we have to take it a step farther. There's plenty of handguns in these streets as well. These are, these are the number one killer in this city of Philadelphia is by a nine millimeter. That is still something that we need to be in address. It's great that we get assault weapons off the street, but what are we going to do about the illegal handguns that's on the street? I lost my brother when he was 21 years old to a handgun. I lost plenty of friends to a handgun. This is a trauma that's set with many of us is up here that we deal with on a daily basis, regardless of race or religion, age or gender. We are all victims of this trauma. We have to do more. We have to encourage our community to do more. This is not a one-size-fits-all. We have to listen to our counterparts who are against us making these absolute changes to the law because they still believe in certain things that they, they fundamentally believe in. They were raised as hunters. They were raised in, in, in the wild. They want to be ensured that their voices are being heard, so we have to respect that. What I am proud to see here today is a coalition of not just the state or the local or the fact we are all coming together for one common cause, and that is to get illegal firearms off our streets and make our streets safer because that's the number one thing folks want to see in this city. And a part of that is addressing our poverty issues. A part of that is addressing our schooling issues. A part of that is addressing all the quality of life issues that we have in the city of community, in the city of Philadelphia. I read the report on homicide from 2016. The number one reason why folks were, in, were uh, dealing with homicide or shootings was over an argument. It's the number one reason folks are drawing guns out and we're getting into these confrontations over a disagreement. We haven't learned how to deal civically with each other where it doesn't result in someone losing their life. I can tell you from experience, it's not fun to bury a loved one. It is not fun to see someone die at such a young age. It's not fun to attend a funeral of a teenager. There is no reward there. 
We have to do better. We can't just talk about it here at this podium. We have to go out in these streets. And we have to make sure we're putting the work in. And it's not just going to happen with the individuals you see up here. It's going to happen with the community by sticking together, coming together, and coming up with a solution. And I want to thank everyone who came out. And I want to thank the city of Philadelphia for standing together. And I want to thank you, Mayor, for leading the charge and bringing us together. So thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for, for coming here today and all which has been said. Uh, we need to work together and now take the opportunity to uh, open up for some questions. Yes. Yep. Two things. First of all, uh, my executive order, which I was going to announce today, but because of what happened last night, I'm here. But at 10 o'clock tomorrow, I'll be having a press conference to talk about executive actions, things that I can do as governor. But I'm also going to be calling tomorrow for the General Assembly, as Senator uh, Street talked about, uh, to do the things that, that they need to do very quickly. I mean, there, there are bills ready to go. Uh, and I think there is uh, an appetite, maybe, finally, on the other side to actually start doing this, the, some of these, pushing some of these bills forward. So those are the two things that I'm going to be pursuing, and they are not just thoughts and prayers. They are actually working to get something done to get guns out of the hands of people like the guy who had the gun last night. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I personally am in support of that. Uh, I'm not sure wh where the courts are. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, uh, I know Pittsburgh has already done that, and so I, I support that. So I just wanted to say, Senator Corvette and Representative Frankel have bills uh, that are ready to go, have been introduced both in the House and the Senate that would allow uh, that to take place. Uh, and Senator Maria Mar Mar Fred Wright in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Senator Dan Frankel, I mean, Representative Dan Frankel from the city of Pittsburgh has offered legislation that would do exactly that. Again, the question is, will it actually will it pass? get to my desk? Say the last part again. What do I? Oh, the solution, the gun violence in general. So, just starting with your first question, uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions because that, that crime scene is still fluid, and that uh, just prior to me getting here, we still were not able to gain access because when you use uh, tear gas, it, it still remains inside for a long time. And so, you know, you have to take the necessary precautions. So I can't even tell you what uh, additional weapons he may have had beyond what we know. We know that he had one handgun that, believe it or not, he had in his pocket when he came outside and surrendered. Um, we know that he had an AR-15, which is likely the weapon that he was firing at the police uh, repeatedly. I cannot tell you how many times he reloaded. Uh, that's a question that we'll try to figure out from the ballistic evidence out there based on uh, magazine capacity. Uh, but those are things that we haven't pinned down yet. There are still several things about this investigation that we have to pin down that we will be getting you in short order because when you haven't finished a crime scene, you know, you, you have so many missing elements. But as I said, that, that, was, uh, that was an incident unlike anything I've seen in my 30 years uh, where that many police officers were struck by gunfire. Um, and fortunately, they're all okay, and, and even equally important, no civilians were struck, um, including a suspect, for that matter. Uh, we, we know, to the second part of your question about solutions, as was stated previously, there, there is no one solution. You should hold your police department accountable uh, 
to some degree for gun violence. We don't shirk that responsibility. The only thing that we differ on relative to that is when you place the sole responsibility. And, and it always baffles me a little bit because you'll get people who in one breath will say, this is clearly not a police problem. In the next breath, the same people will say, well, what are the police doing? You know, it's, it's almost like a default button that people have. When we don't know what to do about a problem, this is what we do. And so that's nice, but it doesn't solve anything. And so, obviously, the problem is very complex, gun violence in general. We see it in big cities all across the nation. And so I think we'd be remiss if we resorted to just pinpointing one thing. There's definitely not one thing. I am a firm believer, as the um, state rep said, that poverty is a big driver. You look at cities across this country that, that are dealing with deep, concentrated poverty, you see the same thing play itself out over, over and over again. I'm not trying to disparage those cities. I'm joining them in saying cities like Baltimore, cities like uh, Milwaukee, cities like, um, you know, uh, many, many others. I mean, you got, you got them everywhere. Even in great New York City that does a wonderful job, got one of the greatest departments in the nation, still in Bronx and Brooklyn. They're still dealing with those issues relative to the rest of their city. And so all of us have to do this. We have to work collectively. We also have to not be afraid to talk about other things. There's one thing that nobody writes about, I've been, been doing this and been around a long time. I've yet to see an article about personal responsibility yet. Yet. I, I, don't, I don't see that. So uh, you have to understand that this, this was a dynamic situation and that there are different phases of um, the whole incident, even relative to the hostages, even relative to the, what was at the end of barricade because they were, the hostages and, uh, were all extracted. Um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about how SWAT was able to get them out because some of that's tactical that they may have to use again. I will tell you, though, it was just some remarkable police work. I mean, the strategy that they used, they were very methodical. Um, it wasn't just one thing, and now we're going to do what we have to do to get the, the hostages out. There was a series of things that they, they did in order to ensure that the scene was as safe as possible for them, the hostage, as well as for the suspect. Because when we told him repeatedly we wanted him to get out safely, we meant that. You know, preservation of life is important for all concerned, and I think we demonstrated that last night. Uh, so. There are multiple aspects uh, to this whole issue. When, when, when he was in there alone, obviously there's a lot of talking, just like it was previously. There was a lot of talking going on while we were extracting uh, the uh, hostages. So it's not one thing, uh, but certainly uh, he was not willing to come out for a long, long time, and he had to be persuaded to do so by means that we use, uh, that we already spoke about. absolutely unnerving, and I'll speak that for me. Um, always responsible for all these men and women, uh, and so with that, you know, comes a degree of anxiety in a certain situation like that, and this was no different. When you know you have uh, two police officers who are trapped along with civilians upstairs with a gunman who has already shown you, even while I was present, that he was willing to still fire at police, um, you're worried about getting everybody out safely, and you don't know in the moment how you're going to do that. Um, because, you know, anything could go wrong at any one moment. And so one of the things that, you know, I, I'm just amazed by is the ability of those two officers to remain calm for as long as they did for hours. And so they were in communication with an officer who was standing right next to me on a telephone. And, and that, in many ways, guided our decision to do what we needed to do. What would have been far worse for us is if we had lost communication and didn't know whether they were alive, whether he had them at gunpoint, and so that would have forced an entirely different situation. Or, worse yet, if we knew that um, this individual decided to charge the steps upstairs to where they were. So knowing that they were safe, they were very calm, they were reassuring, um, knowing that 
you know, at different times there was a lull in the shooting and that, you know, we took advantage of that. All those things were advantageous to us and we were able to really think it through and wait it out where normally or under <coughs> different circumstances we wouldn't have had a choice, you know. And I will tell you candidly, and this is an unnerving, unnerving thing to say, but in consulting with my experts early on, I said, what, what are we going to do? We've got two officers trapped upstairs. We've got civilians trapped upstairs. He's just fired at us. What are we going to do? And to have one of the more experienced supervisors tell me rather candidly, while we clearly can go inside, we are going to come under gunfire. I just had six officers shot. I mean, immediately had to reassess that, knowing everything I just told you about the officers being okay, you know, and not want to create a more volatile situation than it already was. So we were blessed to have that communication. I think that was one of the key things that was, that was critical in, in our decision making. So what, what we're doing, that's one of the things we, we are a part of the entire investigation. We know there was a search warrant on that block which led to the other house and we're just trying to pin all that down. We know there was a possibility of some exigent circumstances, but we'll have to get back to you on all that. Again, this is all dynamic and, and, and ongoing, but we'll get back to you as we figure all it out. A lot of that won't take place completely until this crime scene is uh, processed and we're going to be out there for hours because of everything that is involved. Thanks everybody. Yeah, sorry, you're